everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, I'd like to remind everybody at the top, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Okay, so this week has already kind of been a bit of a humdinger. We've had two stories that have really been dominating the news cycle this week, one of which is kind of ridiculous and one of which is actually pretty damn serious. But before we get into all that, I want to go ahead and start with now that we are past the whole Brett Kavanaugh thing, which you guys, you guys remember Brett Kavanaugh, right? He was the Supreme Court justice that got confirmed and and all we could do was talk about him for three weeks. But ever since he's been confirmed, we've not spoken his name since then. You guys remember him, right? But now that we're past that whole kerfuffle, now we are getting into the home stretch for the midterms. We're roughly about two weeks out now, a little over two weeks, and yeah, it's everything's starting to ramp up quite a bit. You're starting to see more of the attack ads come out. You're starting to really see people like kind of lean into the home stretch and really make their last final pitches and Oh boy, I would just like to go on record by saying the next two weeks are going to be an utter and complete dumpster fire if you do follow politics. So just go ahead, buckle up, just hold on tight, make sure you have plenty of your favorite alcohol available or other illicit substances as you prefer. But yeah, this is just, this is going to be nuts. Like I, I can already see the next two weeks just being absolutely batshit insane especially based off of what we've already seen come down the pike this week. But what is interesting, though, after the whole Kavanaugh thing, is that now a lot of races that seem to be really kind of cut and dried for Democrats are becoming a coming really close to being a toss-up. And in some cases, the Republicans are starting to take over the Democrats, especially in some of these more vital battleground seats that Democrats were hoping to get so that they can take control of the House, at least, and maybe control of the Senate, although it looks like that's not going to happen. But there has been, I think, a bit of a Kavanaugh backfire, which I predicted this was going to happen, and it looks like I was right that Democrats pretty much overplayed their cards wildly on the Kavanaugh thing, really pissed off a lot of people, and it's really going to come back to bite him in the ass in the midterms. And it looks like I'm going to be right. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. But what I've seen discussed kind of, and it's not a bad discussion to have, but kind of what happens after November 6th, as far as what happens if the quote unquote blue wave doesn't happen Which, I mean, at this point, I'm just trying to get past the next two weeks. Like, that's where my focus is. But past that, I I don't know. I really don't know what will happen. Because I think, obviously, they're not going to take the Senate. I don't think. I don't think they're going to make the gains in the House that they need to make. I don't think they're going to take over the House. It could still happen. Honestly, at this point, anything can fucking happen. Like, who the hell knows? But this idea that if the blue wave doesn't happen, that these sort of lefty type people are going to, I guess at this point, you can't even say double down, triple down, quadruple down, whatever down we're at now on just their insane bullshit. And yeah, I can see that happening, but I don't know what that gets them. I don't know where it leads anybody. And it kind of leaves that whole like Hillary Clinton civility comment, like, well, we can't have civility until we have Democrats back in control, which, okay, shit, that, can, can everybody please just tell Hillary to shut the fuck up? Like, why is anybody still interviewing Hillary? Why are her and Bill going on a speaking tour? Like, go away. I thought everybody made this clear that we just want you to go the fuck away. Why won't you leave? Why do people keep interviewing her? Why are people going to go to this speaking tour? Like, stop. Stop. I would think that Democrats would want her to go the hell away, especially after 2016. But like I said before, They still have not unpacked 2016, so maybe they're not at the point of being mad enough at Hillary to tell her, like, shut the fuck up and go away. But, yeah, I just, I I wanted to start with that because I do think, honestly, I don't know. I really don't know what the hell is going to happen on November 6th. I don't know what's going to happen past that. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It will definitely be interesting to see how this all pans out. 
One more topic I want to talk about in this vein before we move on to the insanity of the week is the whole get out the vote campaign and the whole campaign to get people signed up to the voter rolls that has happened over the past couple of weeks or so. And like social media and internet companies have gone in on this. I mean, Twitter, Instagram, just Google, everybody everywhere has had these like go register to vote campaigns. And I'm like, I've not seen anything this intense since. And yes, I'm totally going to show my age here because I am kind of an old. I remember the vote or die campaign. You guys remember that from back in the day on MTV, which does, does MTV even exist anymore? Does anybody watch MTV? But yes, there was once a time, young people, that MTV was very popular and they showed music videos and they had a campaign called Vote or Die. And they had this rapper and his name was P. Diddy. And he did advertisements to get people out to vote. Yeah, it was a long time ago. It was a very weird time. If you weren't there for it. If you're young and you don't remember all that. But it's been weird for me to see this. It Not weird, but... Especially for a midterm election. Like normally you see this for like a presidential election. I've never seen anybody kind of concentratedly in like a unified fashion go in this hard to get people out to the votes on a midterm. Which really speaks to where we are right now. Like as a country in politics that so many people are so vested in a midterm election because it's Traditionally speaking, you just you don't get the voter turnout for midterms that you get for presidential presidential years because obviously you're not electing a president. Like people normally go to the polls to elect a president, and so you vote down ticket while you're there. But usually people don't really show up for midterms unless they're like super hardcore into politics and really care about like Congress and even like state issues, local issues, stuff like that. So it's interesting. I'm really I'm interested to see what the voter turnout is going to look like. I really am. Because like I said, there has been this huge push and I don't know what it's going to result in. I really don't. I mean, I know what Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Google and all of them are wanting it to be. Like their their ideological bent is pretty obvious. But whether that's going to pan out or not, I don't, I don't know. That's going to be a really fascinating thing to see. But moving on from talking about the midterms to what may end up being the most insane political story of 2018, which is that Elizabeth Warren finally took a DNA test. Now, I really, I'm still just, I'm still shook over this whole story because I cannot, I I can't believe she thought this was a good idea. Like, this is just the hardest cell phone I've seen In a long time, it may be the hardest cell phone ever, possibly. What she did was she took a DNA test. And it looks like, now, fraction-wise, she is one 124th Native American, which converted over to decimals because I am much better with decimals decimals than I am with fractions. That would be 0.0009%. Native American. Now, a normal person, upon having this DNA test and realizing that this identity that they've built for themselves around being a certain race, when you find out that you're not really that race, you would probably just like throw it in the trash and we're just going to pretend like that never happened. We're not going to talk about it. Elizabeth Warren is apparently not a normal person because she did not do that. In fact, she did the exact opposite. She took those DNA results and made this slick little, I guess, I'm just going to call it a campaign ad because let's keep it real. That's what it is, where she goes home and talks to her family and this, that, and the other, and does this big reveal of her DNA results that show that she has a drop of Native American blood in her. So, ha ha ha, I am a Native American. I was right and all of you are wrong and Donald Trump can shut up. Yeah, that that didn't exactly work out the way Warren planned. 
because of those numbers that show that um, you're really not any kind of Native American to speak of. And just as a reference, I told you that she was 0. 0.0009 Native American. Your average Native-born American, depending on the rest of their genetic makeup, whether you are of more European descent or African descent, you're normally anywhere between 0.18 to 0.8% Native American. So not only is Elizabeth Warren not Native American, she is less Native American than your average Native-born American. Elizabeth Warren is whiter than me. And I did not think that was humanly possible because as I tweeted out when all this came out, I tweeted out my, my Ancestry.com results and I am white as fuck. I am pretty much just straight up European across the board. Although now I have 1% of Andean Native American in me, which means that according to those rules, if Elizabeth Warren is a Native American, then I'm an Incan. So I am now an Incan princess and I'm going to live my life as an Incan princess because those are the new rules. <laughs> Moving on. I'm not actually going to live my life as an Incan princess. There will be no blood sacrifices. Don't worry. We're not, we're not going to do all that. But obviously she releases this video like it's some big fucking aha got you. And Twitter and social media and pretty much the internet itself completely lost its shit because if I remember correctly, I think it was the Boston Globe that ran the first print story on this and are the first people that came up with the numbers as far as her Native American heritage. And they ended up having to print the funniest correction I think I've ever seen because when they originally did it, they got the math wrong. And even by their math, I want to say... On the original one, she was one 215th Native American, but it was something along those lines. It was still like a ridiculous fraction. But even then, they had to go back and print a correction saying, no, we, we got the math wrong. She's actually even less Native American than we had originally published. And it was just like, oh my God. But of course... Of course, you still had people that wanted to jump up and try to defend her and circle the wagons, pun intended, but basically say that this does prove that she's Native American. And all of us are like, no, no, it doesn't. Like, it was just, it was insane. Like, this was the dumbest, dumbest political stunt I've ever seen. I cannot believe that, like, Anybody in her camp thought this was a good idea. Like, who looked at this and was like, yes, run it. Fuck Donald Trump. We got you. Donate our million dollars. Ha! Which, of course, they then did try to call out Donald Trump on the million dollar offer, which, if you don't remember, back, I think it was, I don't, it wasn't during one of the debates. It was probably during one of the, the campaign speeches back in 2016, where he said that, if Elizabeth Warren took a DNA test and it proved that she was Native American, that he would donate a million dollars to her charity of choice. Which, yeah, being, being, hold on, 0.0009% Native American blood does not make you a Native American at all. So that, it was, this has just been like the funniest story ever. Like, it's so stupid, but it's hilarious. Because... Again, Elizabeth Warren has made so much hay about being Native American and about having high cheekbones and about her family story about how her mommy and daddy had to go elope because her mom was part Cherokee and her daddy's family just wasn't having it and blah, 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 which I mean, whatever. I mean, that may very well be the story she was told growing up. I mean, the Warren family wouldn't be the first family to like Disneyfy their backstory and make it a little more glamorous and sexy. But at some point, if you're going to self-identify as something, you should probably make sure that you actually are the race that you're self-identifying as. So, yes, I certainly wouldn't have done this, but there she went. She did it. And my God, like Trump trolled her. Trump trolled the fuck out of her and she fell for it. And I really, I can't 
I can't believe it. Like, I really cannot believe that she fell for it. And this would be like a stupid bullshit nonsense story that we could all laugh at. Except for the fact that based on her family story, basically, I I guess that's what she was basing this on. Obviously, it wasn't on any kind of DNA test results. She self-identified as Native American when she was working for Harvard. Now, I'm not... I've, I've seen conflicting reports about whether she self-identified as Native American when she was applying to colleges. So I don't really want to speak on that because I don't know if she did or not. But we do know that she did self-identify as Native American during the Harvard hiring process. And during her little slick video, she had people come on that have hired her, including people from Harvard Law, because she did, she was a professor at Harvard Law for a while, saying that, her race was not a factor in her hiring. Now, Harvard, we see you. And and this is this has been an ongoing issue with Harvard, but thinking back to where Harvard was at in the 90s when they did hire her, they were and are and have been having a huge problem with their whole diversity sort of, I guess, I don't, I don't know, I guess you would just call it a quota system, if we're going to be completely honest, of a hiring or admitting students based on their ethnicity. <clears throat> Talking about you, Harvard, and your current Asian American problem and your past Jewish problem. But maybe, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't know. But what Harvard did do that we do know happened is that they touted Elizabeth Warren when she achieved tenure as being the first woman of color to achieve tenure at Harvard. Now, putting aside the the Harvard thing, because they're problematic on this anyway, the only reason you identify as something that is a minority, unless you are honestly the minority, you do it because there are, especially in academia, as far as whether you're applying to be a student at a school or you're applying to be faculty, there are different standards for different ethnicities. And that is something that I wish this situation could have brought up that topic a little bit more because it's something I would like to talk about. And that is this kind of tiered standard that all colleges have. I mean, I don't mean just to slam Harvard on this, although theirs has been particularly problematic over the years. But this idea that, yes, if you say that you are white versus black versus Latino versus Asian versus Native American, whether you're, and even breaking it down even further than that, if you want to say, especially if you go with Asian, like if you want to say that you're Chinese, Japanese, Pacific Island, whatever part you're from, there are different admission criteria for different ethnicities. And that is something that really, really needs to stop. Like now, like yesterday, last week, last month, last year, last decade, your race, your ethnicity should not have any bearing on you being admitted into a university, either as a student or as faculty. No, this fucking needs to stop. And if you're not aware of, I've, I've referenced it a little earlier, but if you're not aware of what's going on at Harvard right now, currently they're being sued. And I forget, I'm, I read it, I forget the kid's name that started the lawsuit, but basically, the, the the lawsuit states that Harvard is currently discriminating against Asian and Asian American students based on the fact that they want a specific ethnic makeup for their school. And if they did not have these sorts of affirmative action kind of quotas in place, that they would have too many Asians, like too many Asians would make it through the process. So you have to kind of like 
cap the amount of Asians that you're going to allow in and cap the amount of different ethnicities that you're going to let in so that you have the specific diversity makeup that you're looking for instead of just picking the best and brightest, which obviously that is discrimination. That's that's racism. Like if we're being dead ass honest, that's fucking racist to have these caps and say that, okay, well, we've reached our quota of Asian people. So even though you are way, way more qualified than this white student or this black student or this Latino student or whatever other student, you can't come in because you're not that race. Like that's fucking racist. And I'm interested to see where this lawsuit's going to go. And I say that because it was known back in the day, back in the 20s, back in the 30s, that Harvard did this exact same thing to Jewish students. And it's not like, when I say like Jewish students, like I don't know if you guys are familiar with the bell curve and all that stuff. And the idea that Charles Murray put out that Ashkenazi Jews have the highest IQ, which I don't know. I think IQ is bullshit anyway, but that there are a lot of very smart Jewish people. And there were a lot of Jewish people applying to Harvard back then, and they didn't want the, the school to become too Jewish. So they basically did the same thing back then, is they capped the amount of Jews that they allowed in the school. And again, that's fucking racist. So it's, it's been a long problem that Harvard's had, and it's something that happens with their students. It also happens with faculty, too, where you try to have this diverse faculty and so obviously people get promoted over other people because of their race, which is not a right. That's just not okay. But moving on from that, and just, I, I went into that whole rant just to show that, like, this is a stupid fucking story. Like, it's dumb, it's whatever. But there were actual ramifications to her identifying as Native American. And she did probably, if we're being honest, get perks for being identified as Native American and she got celebrated for being Native American because, like I said, Harvard celebrated her as the first tenured woman of color, which she's not a fucking woman of color. She's white as hell. So it just, it, and it kind of goes to show that, like, affirmative action is really stupid in that way because unless you're having somebody prove their ethnic makeup, like, how the fuck are you going to know that? Like, I can tell you that I'm what the fuck ever. Like, how are you going to know unless you DNA test me? Like, seriously, the whole idea is just dumb. So, anyway, back to the story. So, after all this came out, it came out that the DNA results were just stupid and bullshit. Cherokee Nation, which, by the way, she uh, Warren had identified as Cherokee. So, Cherokee Nation released a statement saying, kind of, the, the TLDR version is that no, having one drop of Cherokee blood does not make you Cherokee. And in fact, being part of Cherokee Nation, which is, is a thing, I'll explain that in a second. But that being a part of Cherokee Nation is not just about your blood or your DNA. It's about being a part of the nation. It's about being part of the community. It's about participating. And basically, they straight up said that Elizabeth Warren's nonsense is harmful to tribal interests because she's not part of the tribe. And so claiming to be part of the tribe, you're you're kind of, you're, no. Basically, basically Cherokee Nation was like, yeah, this doesn't, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. That's not how you become a part of the Cherokee Nation and part of the Cherokee tribe. And just as a, as kind of a, a side divergence, if you weren't aware of how this works, there is a pathway. Well, I don't know if you really call it a pathway, but there is a process to being a part of a specific Native American tribe. And you have to kind of like apply and show that you have the right ancestry or that you have the right amount of whatever tribe's blood you have, like whether it's, you know, Cherokee, Chippewa, Troka, whatever tribe that you're claiming to be part of, there is a process and you have to like show that you are indeed part of the tribe. And Nancy Rommelman actually wrote a really good piece about it. I'll link it in the show notes that explains that process a little better than I can. But yeah, it's not like, it's not like claiming to be, say, 
Irish American or Italian American or Polish American or anything like that. Like there is actually like a process and like a certification that you go through basically. And it's, it's a much more formalized process than just saying, Hey, I have X amount of Cherokee in me. So I'm Cherokee. Like it's, it's a little more involved than that, but going ahead and moving on. So obviously like Cherokee nation is pissed. Native Americans are pissed because this is just <sighs> poor Native Americans. You know, Native Americans are the most marginalized group in America. Change my mind. But it's it's kind of it goes on to this idea that there are a lot of people out there that claim Native American blood and and claim the heritage and they're not part of it. And I think Native Americans are starting to get a little sick of our shit on that one. So I can't say I blame them. But there's been a lot of thought pieces written about Elizabeth Warren claiming Cherokee blood and how basically now that the DNA tests are out, that it's it's always been bullshit. And they've always thought it was bullshit. But now it's kind of like easier to say that it's bullshit in public because it obviously is. But it's just... I'm I'm so happy that like native Twitter had this moment. Like you got to have this moment of just going in on this white woman culturally appropriating your culture and claiming it as her own while having nothing to do with it, not even DNA speaking being part of it, let alone actually participating in the culture. It's just like I'm I'm happy for them. I'm glad that they now are free of the burden that is Elizabeth Warren claiming to be Cherokee because she has high cheekbones. But another thing that I did not see happen is the cultural appropriation mob. Where are they at? Why aren't they coming after Warren? Since it has now been shown that she is not Native American and she is not Cherokee, but she has been appropriating Cherokee culture for decades. Where are they at? Why aren't why aren't they dragging her through the streets like you, like like, like they drug a poor girl through the streets for wearing a Chinese dress to her prom, but you've got nothing to say about Elizabeth Warren, really? Okay, all right, I see you. <laughs> like it just it just shows how absolutely fucking ridiculous that whole cultural appropriation thing is because here we are have an example of somebody who was literally culturally appropriating and it's fucking crickets. Anyway, before we leave the Elizabeth Warren situation, it's, it's been discussed what this does to her chances in 2020. Now I've maintained that the Dem ticket in 2020 will be Warren Booker. And I'm still standing by that because right now it is October of 2018. This whole thing will have completely blown over by the time she's ready to run. I still think that she's going to have the establishment approval. And of course, Trump is going to beat her over the head with this if she is the nominee. But he was going to do it anyway. So I don't really see this changing that calculus. So yeah, I don't think this did. I don't think this tanked her chances in 2020. Some people have said that it should, like, straight up disqualify her, which, I mean, what what even tanks a campaign anymore? Like, we we have a dude in the White House who was on tape saying that he just walks up to women and grabs them by the pussy. Like, if you can survive that, like, what can a candidate not survive? Like, what tanks a candidacy now? Is it this? Maybe? I don't know. I don't think so. Like I said, if maybe if this was closer to 2020, it might do more damage. But I think we're far enough away from that campaign that this is this is not going to make the dent that a lot of people think it's going to make. All right, so to move on from the Elizabeth Warren situation to the Jamal Khashoggi situation, which if you've not been following this, let me fill you in on this. Jamal Khashoggi was, I, I think everybody's on board with, was a journalist who was working for the Washington Post. He was a Saudi, he was a Saudi national. He used to be kind of in tight with the Saudi royal family, kind of fell away from them and started becoming a critic of the royal family. So what seems to have happened, and of course this is all very murky right now because there's there's two stories going around, but 
what we seem to know is that he was marrying a Turkish woman. So he needed to go to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to obtain a document that they were going to need for their wedding. So he goes to the consulate. There is video of him entering the consulate. There is no video of him exiting the consulate. And we're on, I think, either day 16 or 17 of nobody seeing this dude. What the Turkish, what the Turkish official story, which will, will actually, let me not get ahead of myself. What they have said to the media is that there was a 15 man Saudi hit squad in the consulate waiting for him to show up. And basically, as soon as he walked into the consulate, they nabbed him, they drugged him, they beat him, and then, for for lack of putting this more delicately, they hacked up his body. They basically, and, yeah. And there seems to be, at least from Turkish officials who are talking to media, again, he wasn't dead when they started the hacking and yeah so what the Saudi story is right now is that they don't know what happened they had nothing to do with it and they are going to investigate what happened and this is the story that they have told Donald Trump over the phone and Mike Pompeo to his face Okay. Now, the thing that is sort of interesting about this story is that Turkish officials are speaking to the media about this. And they are saying that they have both audio and video of what went down. Which is a tacit admission that they had the Saudi consulate bugged. Which... Me being the cynic that I am, that's not surprising. I mean, I would imagine that every embassy here on U.S. soil has been bugged by the U.S. government. Like, I don't think that anybody would be surprised to find that out. But just the admission that they have audio and video, allegedly, is the admission that you had the place bugged. And that's kind of like saying the quiet part out loud. So that was very, very interesting. And the second thing that's been very interesting to me about this, and I've stopped to ask myself this question more than once during this story, is that Turkish officials are being very, very loose-lipped about this to the media. And I mean, I don't, they're not making like vague accusations. Like they're laying out like timelines. They're saying like, okay, he walked in at this time. They nabbed him at this time. This person was there. That person was there. This is what was said. This is what was said. That they there was that this was all a setup. That like some people were told to like put on headphones so you don't have to listen to it and to leave the room. And like like the details that they're putting out there are pretty fucking detailed. Like I first of all I don't think that you put out there that you have audio and video of this if you don't have audio and video of this because otherwise you could really end up looking like. A bunch of idiots but it's just it's it's been interesting and to the best of my knowledge I know Trump has asked for the audio and video in his own little dickish way is asking like can I have access to it if it exists which I like I said I don't doubt that it does honestly I'm not I would not be at all shocked that the Turkish government bugged the Saudi consulate in Istanbul like that would not surprise me one damn bit but it's, this is, if this went down the way that the Turkish officials are saying it did, this violates pretty much every diplomatic norm that I can possibly think of. Like, you do not nab somebody and kill them in a consulate. Like, that's, like, home free. That's safe space. That's, like, you don't, you don't get fucked with. Like, that's why they tell U.S. travelers traveling abroad, like, if shit hits the fan, if something goes wrong, get to the U.S. embassy and wait there because that's, that's home space. That's home free. Like, that's, that that's, that's where you're supposed to go. 
And the idea that the Saudis sent a hit squad to murder and hack up a journalist in a consulate is not a good look at all. Like, period. Like, no, 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 no. This is not... This is not okay. So, moving forward with the story, that's where we're at right now. Like I said, I, I have not seen the audio or video be released. Maybe it will be in the future. Basically, where the U.S. is at right now is they sent Mike Pompeo over to to talk to the Saudi royal family to kind of figure out what's going on. And the official stance right now is that we are in a wait and see mode to see what happens with this investigation, which the investigation is being led by the Saudis and the Turkish. So, (laughs) okay, this is almost like sending cops in to investigate when one of their own kills somebody. Like, what the fuck is going to come of this investigation that you think you're going to find out? Anyway, that's where the official U.S. position is right now. Now, as for my position on it, here's my thing. (laughs) I'm I'm still, like, in shock that the the House of Saud would sit there and, I'm going to say, lie to Trump and Pompeo. Because there is no fucking way on God's green earth you could possibly convince me that somebody was murdered and... I mean, at this point, nobody's really, nobody's operating under the assumption that this dude's alive anymore. Like, everybody's pretty much operating under the assumption that he's dead. So, it's it's not really a stretch to say that he is no longer amongst the living. But to say that a journalist who has been critical of the Saudi regime somehow disappeared in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul just magically, and that the House of Saud knows nothing about it and doesn't know how it happened? Get the fuck out. Like, seriously? No. That's that's a dead-ass lie. That is a bold-faced lie right there. Because you cannot... That, that's not how this works. Like, that's not how Saudi Arabia works. Like, there's no rogue bands of people fucking roaming around the planet killing journalists who are critical of the Saudi regime without them knowing. That's not even remotely feasible. So this whole Pollyanna line of, oh, gee, I don't know what happened to him. That's a lie. We don't need to go on Maury. That's a lie. I'll tell you right now. So that is my first problem with this. And just... I just <sighs> Listen. Even if you don't care about Jasogi, you don't care about journalists, you don't care what Saudi Arabia does in their own consulate, wherever, whatever, you don't care about any of that, shouldn't you care that our quote-unquote ally just lied to the president and the United States? Like, even if you're not pissed off about any of the rest of this, even if you are not, you don't care, you don't think it's our problem, the fact that they lied is a problem. And it goes to this idea that Saudi Arabia has felt for a long time, correctly, honestly, I mean, they're not wrong, that they can basically do whatever the fuck they want and we're not going to say shit. And they can lie about it. They can they they can do whatever and there's not going to be any consequences to their actions. And like I said, they're not wrong. They're not misguided in that view. But it's just... I mean, blatantly pissing on somebody's head and telling them it's rain. It's just like, if anything pisses you off about this, that should piss you off about this. Because they are our quote-unquote allies, which, whatever, when the hell was the last time Saudi Arabia did something for us, aside from sell us oil, while we, I don't know, I guess turn our backs and ignore what's happening in Yemen and ignoring what happens in the Middle East and ignoring the proxy wars that they're fighting? Like, okay, sure, I guess that's fucking cool, whatever, oil. It's just like, oh my god, like, I, I've seen so many people try to not necessarily defend Saudi Arabia, but try to downplay this as less of a big deal than it is, and I'm just like, no, this this is a big fucking deal, like, murdering journalists is a big deal. Like, if, if you at all care about the First Amendment, 
yes, murdering journalists is a big deal. Lying about it to the president and the secretary of state should be a big deal. But some people still want to say that, oh, well, we can't, we can't upset Saudi Arabia because they're our allies and they're the only ones bringing stability to, to the Middle East. And I'm like, okay, first of all, get the fuck out of here with the stability in the Middle East bullshit. At least half of the instability in the Middle East is directly attributed to Saudi Arabia. They're not stabilizing shit. All they're doing is running around and starting shit with other countries that keep trying to fight this proxy war with Iran. And it's just, no, half of the problem with the Middle East is Saudi Arabia. Like this, no, no, they're not providing stability. They're making it more unstable. Like, this, am I the only person that knows about Yemen? Like, where, where are you people on this? It's just, oh my God, just, uh. but the one thing, the one thing I'm kind of hoping happens here. And the one good thing that I'm hoping, 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 hoping <laughs> comes out of this is to maybe start having that discussion about Saudi Arabia and Yemen and specifically the arms deal. So just side note for those of you who don't know about the arms deal, basically right now the U.S. and Saudi Arabia have an arms deal valued at about $110 billion, which they have not began to pay us anywhere near $110 billion, but that's another story, to sell arms to Saudi Arabia. Now, I would imagine that most of you that listen to this also probably listen to Dave Smith, so I don't need to explain to you what happens to these arms once we sell them to Saudi Arabia, and I don't really need to explain to you exactly what's going on in Yemen, outside of just touching on the fact that, yes, basically what is happening in Yemen is that Saudi Arabia is fighting a proxy war with Iran, and Yemen is the battleground. And the Yemen situation is fucking horrifying. It's basically hell on earth right now. And we are providing material support for it. We are selling them arms. We are providing gas for their planes. We are providing military support. And that is fucking horrible. Now, what I am hoping to happen here is that this situation, the, the Jasogi situation, sorry, I cannot talk anymore, that maybe this situation and this renewed like interest and focus on Saudi Arabia and their fuckery will bring that into more of a public discussion because it isn't something that gets discussed very often in mainstream media if at all like typically the, the only person I've ever seen really mention it is Dave and just maybe Maybe if this is the, if this is the thing that gets us to the thing, like if Jasoki's death is the thing that gets us to discussing the arms deal and gets us to discussing Yemen, then maybe his death wouldn't have been in vain. Like maybe there could be something good to come of his death. So that is kind of my hope. I know that there was already, um... I think in the House that there was already a bill floating around to halt the, the arms deal. And I know Justin Amash has now signed on to it and it's starting to gain a little bit of traction based off of the Jasogi situation that in light of that, that we should halt the arms deal, which again, I wish, I, I wish we were getting here through a discussion of Yemen, but if this is what gets us there, I'm not I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Like, I'm okay with that. Like, it's as long as we get there, I'm not going to get picky about how we got there. As far as Trump's reaction to this whole thing has been, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Like, he kind of tried to roll with that whole rogue, rogue killer story, which I think actually he floated that before even the Saudis did, because the original rumors that I saw that what the Saudi story was going to be was that they nabbed him in the consulate, they were interrogating him, and LOL, oops, he died! <laughs> oh, how the fuck did that happen? Gee, I don't know. Which they ended up not going with that and just straight up going with, well, I don't know what happened. Which, uh, shut up. Yes, you do. 
Anyway, but Trump actually did an interview with 60 Minutes that aired this past Sunday. And he was point blank asked about what he planned to do about this current situation. And basically his answer was, I don't know yet. Which, astonishingly enough, Trump somehow managed to stumble on the right fucking answer. Like, I was, I'm like, what? Like, this is a very nuanced answer for a guy that does not do nuance. And I get the argument that some people make that this is a tricky situation between us and Saudi Arabia. Okay. All right. I will give you that. But I was just, I was surprised that Trump actually like landed on the correct answer in that moment of saying like, I don't know. Like, huh. Occasionally a broken clock is right, you know, twice a day. Occasionally he got that one right. So I think he does deserve some applause about that. And to, to his credit, he did not pop off the way he normally pops off and just says, what the fuck ever. So it, it was it was almost a presidential moment. It was it was borderline, like probably as close as Trump's going to get to being a president or being presidential. Which I just I start I still I still can't believe he's president. Like it's just this has been really surreal. It anyway, moving on from that. But the one thing that I kind of before before we leave out on this. It's this vein that I've started to see about how Turkey treats their journalists versus how Saudi Arabia treats their journalists, which, to be sure, both countries are fucking shit on this topic. Like, as far as freedom of speech, freedom of press, anything even involving human rights, both countries suck ass. Let's get that out there right now. But this kind of, like, vis-a-vis comparison of saying like okay well Saudi Arabia did this but Turkey does that it's like we're not talking about what Turkey does to journalists right now that's not the story that's not what we're talking about we're talking about what Saudi Arabia did to a journalist in their consulate in Turkey like don't try to change the story yes Turkey sucks in comparison to the U.S. or any other Western country as far as how they treat their press. Yes, they do jail journalists. Yes, they do disappear them. That's not relevant to what we're talking about right now. And like I said, I have asked myself questions about why exactly Turkey is being so open and free with this information that they're being so open and free with. And ultimately, I don't know. Maybe we'll find out at some point in the future. It does strike me as a bit odd, but I mean, it is what it is at this point. So I just, I wanted to address that because it's just, this this is still an evolving story and there are still kind of narratives because everything is about narrative now. There are still narratives evolving. And that one just really bothered me because it's like, it's no, stop trying to change the fucking subject. Like that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about Saudi Arabia and this journalist. We're not talking about Turkey and their journalist. So let me go ahead on that note and just wrap this up. If you did make it this far, please thank thank you for listening. If you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care and until next time.